everyone. Welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith. And today, as you can clearly see from the thumbnail and the title of the video, which has already spoiled everything, we are doing a top 10 solo games for Fantasy Flight games. That is going to be a lot of fun. Now, if you haven't checked out my most recent top 10 for Come On games, I'll put a link to that in the top right hand corner so you can get caught up on that. But this one is going to be fun. And it's because Fantasy Flight games has been doing solo cooperative gameplay for over a decade. And so because of that, it's nothing new to them. They have they were on the train early when solo wasn't cool per se, and they were actually one of the publishers that made solo gaming cool uh, and actually drove helped to drive that train forward. So they get a lot of kudos from me from that, and I have a lot of really good memories with them, which makes this list building of 10 real fun. Uh, trying to figure out where exactly to put things in this list was a struggle. I actually put them down and then I rejigged them and then rejigged them again, rejigged them again. Like, I think I changed my mind like 15 times. Um, so I will say one thing here is that this list is my point in time list. But if you were to ask me a month from now, I could see a couple of these games shifting up or down a position or two. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? Like, and it's fun when you put these lists together because you know, depending on your state of mind, depending on what you played recently, depending on what your most recent experience is, that can all have impact. So long story short, I'm going into this with no outside bias whatsoever, except my own personal bias, which I'm bringing to the table here as I put together this top 10. So strap in and we're going to start with the honorable mentions and we're going to start with those first five, which I'll very briefly just mention. And then we're going to head right into the top 10 and I'll talk about more about why I like them and, and just point out the ones that will hopefully give you a nice idea of games. If you're coming into the solo hobby as a brand new individual and don't know what to go after, maybe this list will be a big time help for you. So without further ado, let's begin the honorable mentions. The very first honorable mention on the list is going to be Arkham Horror. We're starting in alphabetical order, by the way, for these five honorable mentions. So there's no rhyme or reason for the ranking. But uh, just so you know, too, anything you see down here in terms of the status of the collection, log plays, or any kind of review rating that I might have had in here, none of it's valid. Literally, it's been there for ages and also not upkept in any way, shape, or form. So I've played Arkham Horror a way beyond six times. Like, it's obscene how much I've played it. But at a certain point, I just stopped. Um, so the one thing I do want to mention here is that there's a lot, a lot of expansions for this one. So, I mean, if you get into this thing, you can really fall down the rabbit hole. There's a bunch of things that you can add in that are either fan-made or official. And, uh, if you're going to try and find it and you're going to try and hunt it down, uh, being that it's a game from 2005, you're going to be wanting to look in the secondhand market. Um, if you're look, this game really, it's, it's, it's gritty and it's raw. That's the best way to describe it. It's probably the most gritty and raw HP Lovecraft experience you're going to get. Um, it's chaos on the table. If you get all the expansions, you start kind of mixing them all into the fray. It's going to become just madness. Some people absolutely love that and other people hated it because it kind of diluted, you know, what each expansion was trying to tell in terms of its story. Some people like kind of piecemealing it in expansion by expansion. Um, and pulling out the ones that they didn't really want it to be a part of. But the fact that it's kind of modular that way, you know, lends itself to HP Lovecraft because you can either toss it all in and just have mass chaos or you can try to, you know, create the uh, the scene that you want to have going in. Uh, but long story short, this is a fun one. I don't have it anymore in my collection. I played it to death and I had to let it go because I found other games replaced it. There's a bunch of people that are going to be throwing comments and saying Arkham Horror Second Edition still has legs today. And I agree with you 100%. It definitely does. It's still cool. It's unique. Um, has the mechanisms in the game, you know, held up very well over time? Probably not. Uh, the design could have been better. Now, now, you know, now looking back on it, uh, that we're much further ahead in terms of game design, you might look at a lot of things in, in this second edition and go, mm, could have been better. But for the time when it was originally released, it was pretty awesome. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So it still has legs today. It's still, still worth checking out if you haven't already. So that is the first honorable mention. My second honorable mention is Elder Sign. And man, when I start looking at these games and when they started coming out, it's like, it's, it's insane how much time has gone by. <laughs> like Elder Sign doesn't feel like it's that old, but I guess it is. Um, this is another one that, which is, you know, it, it had a huge following and still does. A lot of people played this thing to death and then they kind of let it go. So if you're in the solo community, you're looking for another HP Lovecraft experience. Again, this one heavily, heavily, heavily relies on dice. 
So you've got to be a okay with dice and dice mitigation and trying to basically uh, complete these different cards with your dice rolls and stuff like that. And of course, knowing full well that the game is going to be trying to screw you as you go through it, but it gives a completely different and maybe quicker way to play an Arkham Horror, or I should say, sorry, an HP Lovecraft experience, where most of the other ones are quite large and take up a lot of table space and kind of go on for quite a few hours. This one can be done much faster, especially once you know the rules and stuff like that. You'll just be digging in this one and running. Um, but it's nice. It's got good art design. It looks cool on the table, has good table presence. I definitely recommend this one still today. So, I mean, you can you can find this one floating around almost all, all the secondhand markets. People are throwing this thing back and forth. Uh, but this was a classic and definitely deserved to be on the honorable mentions. My third honorable mention is Eldridge Horror. And there might be some of you saying, wow, this thing should be in the top 10. This thing is an incredible experience. It stands on its own. And yes, you'd be 100% right. But based on the criteria that I have between my top 10 list and the honorable mentions, the classics are falling into the honorable mentions. And that's exactly where Eldridge Horror lands itself now, being that it is a game from 2013 and it's 2023 now, which is insane to even think about that it's been that long. But Eldridge Horror has you going across the globe, trying to hunt down evil, trying to deal with it, trying to mitigate it. You got dice, you have checks, you have mysteries to solve. You have multiple expansions, very similar in vain to uh, Arkham Horror, second edition, third edition, that type of thing in terms of just layering on mechanisms and gameplay and more ancient ones to go after and take down. I've played this game somewhere in the vicinity of probably 75 times or more. Uh, you can see an example of one of them right here, one of the enemies. You've got tons of different locations to you know traverse across you have many different characters to choose from the game is awesome it's in my collection i refuse to sell it it won't leave my collection until it either gets uh, revamped in a new edition or another game comes out that actually recreates what it does better and i haven't seen it yet so we'll see what happens there now you also notice down here it says it's in my collection that's true i've rated 8.8 .8. that must be a rating from ages ago but that's pretty accurate i was pretty impressed with this game and still am today um and then logged play that is completely inaccurate it should be somewhere around 75 or above but again i stopped logging plays a long time ago in board game geek but this is one you should definitely 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 check out my fourth honorable mention, as you can see, is Gears of War, the board game. This is one that came out in 2011. Another classic, one that's very hard to find out in the wild at this point because, while they're not printing it anymore. The IP has kind of gone up in dust in terms of what Fantasy Flight can do with it, unless, of course, they ever regain it somehow. But currently, they put this one out as well as a number of small kind of expansions or supplements to the game, and then it just fizzled out. Um, and that was it. It's really unfortunate because the gameplay of this one was very, very, very solid. It had a lot of airy movement. It was cooperative. It had dice rolling, hand management. And a lot of it just made... It was such a great... It was probably one of the better early adaptions of a video game to a board game that I can actually like when I say like I like games like Bloodborne from Come On Games like this would have been one of the early adaptions of a video game to a board game I was impressed with um I never got to collect all of the small additional packs from the base uh from after the base game I should say I think I had one of them and not all of them um, but there are some people out there that are still to this day trying to hunt those things down because they're so rare to find in any kind of decent shape. Um, but this is one that's worth looking into. If you can actually get your hands on this one just to give it a shot, it's worth it on the secondhand market. So again, since it's an honorable mention, I don't ever see this thing coming back in any way, shape or form just based on the IP kind of being dropped off by Fantasy Flight, but it's a solid solo game. And last but not least on the honorable mentions, we have Space Hulk Death Angel, the card game. This is one that really, 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 for some reason, just got its hooks into the solo community. As you can see here on Board Game Geek, it even is rated as the best way to play overwhelmingly. Um, and so this was another one that is very similar to Gears of War, which is going to be extremely tough, if not impossible, to try and find one to pry it out of anybody's hands. Because anyone that actually has this game is probably holding on to it at this point. Uh, it's not that it was, you know, massive in stature. It didn't take up much on the game table at all. Um, and that was probably one of the reasons why it was so well loved. It was quick, easy to set up, quick to enjoy, and had a lot of strategy around the gameplay. It did use dice. But the game was very small in terms of its compact size and stuff like that. And it really just kind of struck a chord with everybody based on what is pitted in, which is Warhammer 40,000 in that universe. So that really was a good implementation of that in a board game form back in 2010. So again, trying to find this thing now, you're not going to. But uh, and, and even for me, I have not... 
Uh, once I let this thing go to my collection, I have not seen this game come back through my local secondhand market on Facebook or anywhere uh, in ages because I think the people that actually have this are not letting it go. With my five honorable mentions out of the way, we now move into the top 10 Fantasy Flight solo experiences starting in the 10th position with Arkham Horror 3rd Edition. This is one that I have torn feelings on. Now, I have consumed everything for this game. I've obviously played way more than log plays of seven. As I mentioned before, all this is way off. I actually don't own this game anymore. I sold everything for it. I consumed it all and I let it all go. I uh, enjoyed my time with it. However, the one thing I will say is there are aspects of this game that I did not like. One is there was too much of a merger between the LCG artwork, the Arkham Horror, the Eldritch Horror. There was, it felt like they were taking multiple games that already existed out there and kind of putting them together into this one. Now, it doesn't mean that the design was that way, but the look of it was that way. And it, and it bothered me. And then that coupled with the fact that I did not like how they presented the actual game board because in the second edition of Arkham Horror, it was an actual full rectangle and it had a lot going on on it. And it just felt like a city. Whereas this kind of felt like you were looking at neighborhoods kind of in like this puzzle piece thing. And also the first iteration of this had white lines on absolutely everything, which made it really bad. Although they realized that quite quickly, that, that was a really poor decision and they darkened those lines out. Um, in future printings, but my printing was all in white and I, I was just, I was not having it. Like I, I could not, I couldn't handle it. It was driving me nuts. I was thinking that it should have been done a little bit more like what, uh, this is gonna be a bad example, but Clank has one of them. It may be Clank in space, I think, where there's a board, like a actual board. And then you have modular pieces that sit on top of it to kind of change the game state. And I feel like that's what they should have done for Arkham uh, third edition. They should have had a city board with really cool city artwork on it and then had modular neighborhoods. And that would have just made it feel, and then of course put that grittiness into it, put that like effort to make it gritty like the second edition, maybe not that old school looking, but you know, make it a little modern, but make it gritty. Like that's, that's, uh, that's what I really wanted to see out of it. So it wasn't that the gameplay was the problem. I actually enjoyed the gameplay of Arkham Horror third edition. I just didn't like how it presented itself on the table and it, it, it was like a disconnect for me. So like I said, played through the experience, enjoyed the experience, but then I was like, I think I'll just let it go. And that's what I did. I let it go. Um, the gameplay has some really, really nice artwork as, I'm gonna, as you're going to see as we go through here, but a lot of it you're going to see, as I mentioned, is recycled from the LCG. And so those things, when they cropped up, kind of bothered me a little bit. Um, it kind of felt like it was like they had, you know, ah, taken a a quick route through development and through the artwork side of the equation. But they also had a lot of artwork assets to pull from based on prior content and games. So I kind of don't blame them, but I do blame them. I don't know where I sit on that. I just feel kind of, eh. Um, it doesn't feel like the full amount of effort was really put into this one and it could have been better. So I'm hoping that a fourth edition will really push this thing back into the limelight like it should be. In the ninth position on my list is Mansions of Madness Second Edition. What a truly special game this was. I mean, you had Arkham Horror Second Edition out there in the wild. In 2013, you had Eldritch Horror, and then in 2016, you had Mansions of Madness Second Edition, which dropped an app along with the experience of being inside of a building, doing an investigation, or potentially a neighborhood area doing an investigation. Like it was a very drilled down view of HP Lovecraft, really getting into the nitty gritty of the different interactions of different people, feeling like you're trying to solve a mystery in a specific area while also of course dealing with all the monsters and everything else this game was unique from top to bottom i mean it presented itself very cool on the table you had the app which would drive things then you had the game state itself with all the cards and everything else around it um, this was something special and, and it still is like i still have this in my collection i still play this to this day I am hoping that one day they're going to take everything they've learned from app development from 2016 up until now, which I think is quite a bit based on what we've seen for app driven games that they've released. Um, and take that into a third edition. I mean, this game really needs another kick at the can because I think one more will really put it into a state where I think people will be extremely impressed and they have everything in their wheelhouse to make it happen. 
Uh, it's just a matter of whether they will do it or not. Um, now, if they don't, I will hang on to Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition for a long, long time. But I also went ahead and uh, did this exact same thing with mine. I actually removed those really ugly plastic giant black bases that just covered up all the beautiful artwork and whatever. And I did this. I went and got some clear acrylic bases. Simple thing to do with a knife. You just go underneath of each of the miniatures, cut them off their base, and then you just glue them onto a clear base like that. And man, does it ever make a better table presence when you're playing the game. Um, you can see like that it just looks so much cleaner. Um, so I'm hoping there's small things like that. They're going to change in a potential third edition down the line, just making things, spicing things up, making the app more interesting. Um, there are some people out there that will sit there and say, well, these app driven games, you know, you've got a game state on the table, you've got an app driving it and half of what's on the game state is in the app. So then why are you doing it? And I don't understand the reasoning. Well, it's, there's an immersion factor there. There's an immersion factor. You're not going to get from an app. You're going to get things like music. You're going to get narration. You're going to get a pull through the story that cards can't do for you in a way that's way more unique and way more interesting. And then on top of it, the fact that uh, more content come out, this game had not only expansions come out, but DLC landed in the app as it aged. And so they were able to add scenarios in without actually having you do anything but buy or pay a couple bucks to pick up DLC scenarios without having to actually buy any physical product. And the app is still up and running today, just like every other app out there. So thematic wise, this thing is off the charts because of the app the app pushes the thematic immersion of this game to a whole other level. And I, that's why I think that if they went to a third edition, it would be absolutely insane. They really need to do this. I would love to see it happen because I'm a huge fan of the game. Currently, it sits in a nine for me, though, because I would say that if you're going to play Mansions of Madness, probably the best way to play is what is listed here at three to four players because you get the most of the experience. You can enjoy this one solo and you absolutely will have a blast. But... It's one of those ones where you'll play it solo and you'll enjoy it on your own, but you'll also want to play it with other people. It's just inevitable. You're going to want to. Um, so that's kind of why it's a little bit lower down on my top 10 solo games for Fantasy Flight games, because as a solo game, it's great, but it's not amazing. We now move to the next game, which is sitting in the eighth position and also an app driven experience coming from Fantasy Flight games. This is the Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth, which released Another three years after Mansions of Madness second edition, this one again, lots learned from that second edition and lots put into the app for Journeys in Middle Earth. Now, I want to say on the pro and con side of this, I'm a huge fan of Lord of the Rings. So I have massive bias here. I'm a big time fan, but there was some weakness in this one in terms of its story, mainly around it not necessarily you know, digging into stories that really root themselves into major characters uh, to the point where it's like it really pulls you in. I feel like they could have taken the IP to the next level with this one and really done something super, super cool with it. The expansion started to draw that out much more than the base game did. Um, but that's one thing that I will note on this one is I feel like they could have gone a bit further than they did. They could have pushed the envelope to make it a little bit more wrapped around characters that are more well known in terms of the story. Um, but anyway, long story short, I still enjoy my time with this one. I, I, I also think that there's this weird, there's this weird stage progression that you can see when it goes from Mansions of Madness to Lord of the Rings, Journeys in Middle Earth, and then now up to The Descent, which is, you know, the more more recent app-driven game experience and what's going on in that box and the 3D terrain. Now this that's you can see the progression of what they're trying to get to and what they're doing with the app-driven experience by making it more and more and more immersive beyond just the app. They're making the physical game more immersive. That was something I felt that lacked in Journeys in Middle Earth is the fact that the terrain that was there kind of just felt like flat and kind of like you could, you know, they could have, it would have been cool to see them do what they did with Descent Legends of the Dark um, with Journeys in Middle Earth. That would have been really interesting because I feel like they could have put some really cool terrain together in a cardboard style and that would have really made the game pop because you have these battles and this is what I'm referring to where you, you know, you're, you're going in and you're, um, that's a little bit too close, but you're basically going in and it's just, it's a little stale. And if you guys remember my playthrough in order to spice it up, I basically went and created a scenario that was much more alive beyond what the game actually could show you. The app shows you a really cool representation of what it looks like uh, during gameplay. So you can imagine it, but on the table, it just looked a little bit 
flat, a little bit bland, a little bit empty. Like it was missing something. And also the artwork kind of on some of the tiles was just kind of like almost too generic. So there was some sm- there was some small gripes along the way, but overall the gameplay was fun. The adventure was interesting and I enjoyed my time with it. I still have it, not letting it go. I think it's a solid, solid game. So if you're interested in Lord of the Rings, you absolutely should check it out. If you have no interest in the IP, do not check this thing out. And of course, if, you, if you're if you on board with the After of an Experience or not, that is also going to drive you. But I think this is a good one. This is a solid, solid entry from Fantasy Flight Games. And it really does hit the mark for solo players looking for kind of an adventure that is driven by an app. Number seven on the list belongs to Star Wars Imperial Assault. This is one that came out in 2014. So this was before Mansions of Madness Second Edition. So... This was one of the first, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first entries into an app-driven experience, not from the get-go of when it was released, but I believe the app was released much later. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head if it was released kind of in sync with 2nd Edition or just shortly after it, but somewhere along the lines there, the app dropped, and that's when Solo Play was introduced into Star Wars Imperial Assault with that one. And I can tell you right now, there was something about that initial couple scenarios at the very beginning of the campaign that just sucked me in instantly. And it did exactly what I wanted journeys to do and journeys didn't do it in their core game experience. And that was to put some big name enemies in front of me from the beginning of the campaign to hook me. If you're going to play a game that's going to be driven by an app in terms of story, you want to get something real big right off the hop that shocks you. And that way it hooks you into wanting to continue to play through the game solo. And Journeys, I still played through the whole thing solo, but I found that not having that hook definitely didn't help. Now with Imperial Assault, and the game's been out for quite some time, so I can go ahead and kind of spoil this, but Vader appears early in the experience with the app. And when that happens, you will be a little bit shocked at how quickly he shows up and you'll kind of go, oh, wow, like I did not expect to run into him at this point, this early. And that really kind of ramps up your excitement for what's to come, makes you want to dig in further. And man, do they ever have a lot of content for this one in order to kind of enjoy. And this thing, this was like one of their, one of the games that I want to say evolved the most across uh, Fantasy Flight games over the year. I mean, they released all kinds of different types of content. I mean, they used this game in, in, in a development way as almost like a guinea pig for what they were trying to do with future years worth of games. They, you know, implemented a solo mode through the app. They tested out the app through that. Um, they were they were pushing the envelope of what was possible to kind of cram inside of one single game. This thing, I mean, this thing, if you have everything Fortnite, and I do, um, you've got a lot of content to work through and and there's a lot of mixing and matching of stuff. If you go inside the app, you can basically just tell it, yeah, I have all this content and it all just gets randomly merged into the experience and the app will, uh, you know, sift through your collection and randomly spit out enemies as you're going through it and stuff like this. Like, it's just, it's so good. It's so good. Now there are, I think there are a couple weak spots in the app where it might spit out an enemy in a situation that doesn't make too much sense. But again, you could always just go into the collection and unselect that enemy. If you you know wanted to make sure that that particular one doesn't show up at the right, at the, you know, at the wrong time, let's say. Um, but long story short, this is a very special experience. And I think even outside of the Star Wars IP, if you're not a big fan of Star Wars, I still think it's, a worthwhile thing to dig into. And if somebody out there is selling their collection and it's selling it at a relatively reasonable amount, which might be tough to find because this one is kind of turned into almost like a collector's item at this point, um, then uh, yeah, you should definitely pick this one up to at least try it and see how you like it. Um, I love it. It's never leaving my collection ever. Unless, of course, again, another edition comes out and streamlines it beyond where it's at. But from what I've From what I have with it, I am very, very satisfied. We are now edging closer and closer to the top five, but just outside of it is Descent Legends of the Dark in the sixth position. And this is another app-driven experience. In my opinion, the best app-driven experience that has currently released from Fantasy Flight Games. And it's mainly, again, as I mentioned before, not only what they've learned from all these prior editions of games, 
But on top of it, the fact that they added terrain in that adds a 3D element to the experience, again, kicking up the notch of immersion beyond what is typically expected of an app-driven game. These are the kind of things that I would have killed to see inside of Journeys, Imperial Assault, Mansions of Madness. Like, Could you imagine Mansions of Madness with 3D terrain, like different items in the different rooms and walls and doors? Like, it would just add a whole other layer to the experience that is just missing when you have an app-driven game. And this really, to me, made the game feel more 50-50. It felt more 50% in the app, 50% on the table, because what was on the table was truly exciting beyond what you'd normally see in a typical game. And the gameplay was fun, too. I like this. And the fact that they have another one coming out down the line, I forget off the top of my head exactly what that second one is called, but it... The original alluded to the first one, which is the one I'm talking about right now, a second one, and then a third one. So it's a trilogy from what I'm understanding, but there is another one coming down the pipes here. It is this one right here. So it's coming out in the near future as well, and it's going to add even more fun to the equation and kind of build upon what's already been going on in this one. But I'm, I'm excited for it. Now, one thing I will mention here is that I did not mention Descent... Um, the original descent. So there are going to be some people that are like, wow, like how dare you not, uh, not go ahead and mention that one. Cause that is a classic. One thing I have to tell you is this one I missed out on. So this, and this is on me. So I got into around 2012, I was playing games like mage Knight, and I was playing games like Lord of the Rings living card game. And I was playing games like uh zombicide. I think it just landed for the first time. So Descent just scooted under my radar. I completely missed it. So I don't have a history with it like some people do. Now, for some people, that's going to be... The second edition of Descent is going to be the one that is all about the app and, and it pushing um, the envelope of what I talked about earlier with Star Wars Imperial Assault because it all started there as one of the very first app of implementations that really kind of was like toying around with what was possible. And it was a really well-designed app from what I understand. I just never got the content to be able to play it all myself. I owned the base game, as you can see here, I previously owned, but I think I only got to play it a couple of times before I let it go. Cause I ended up getting in my collection much after it had actually released. So by the time I started playing it, some of the other app-driven experiences were kind of trumping it, in my opinion. And I was kind of like, well, I don't really want to stick around for this anymore. So for me, it wasn't as high. But for some other people watching this video, Journey's second edition, uh, or sorry, Descent second edition, may be one of your top games. And for good reason. This is absolutely one that should be, uh, you know, recognized even in the honorable mentions I did earlier, which is why I'm kind of taking some extra time to do it now because it is a quality, quality game. It's just one I didn't experience enough of to really put into my own personal list. We have now reached my top five territory and we start off with a wild one, which I'm sure half you guys are already in the comment section typing up a storm. This is Fallout in number five and it is there because of how good this thing is to play solo. Yes, you are going to wonder because some of you might have picked this game up as a core game years ago, played it, were not impressed by it, and moved on and never came back. Well, you're missing out, and I'm here to tell you that. <laughs> so Fallout was received very lukewarm. It was a good game when it came out. It wasn't a great game, but it, it felt like it had heart. It felt like it had potential. It was designed interestingly enough like to tie itself to the IP. Like It looked and felt like Fallout, but there were aspects of his gameplay which were kind of lacking in terms of like how you solved your, in terms of how you dealt with your goals to win in the solo capacity were kind of odd. Um, some of it was a little bit restrictive in terms of what you could do. Like you'd have a huge quest deck of cards that you could rifle through. And of course, you'd only get to see the small portions of that deck in a given play. But a lot of people wanted kind of a more open-ended ability to play and, and go across the map and search things and check things out without feeling like they were kind of like pinned down to getting it all done as quick as possible to a victory condition. Um, there was just, an, and then just also the lack of, uh, solo playable scenarios was also an issue too. There was a few, th there was quite a few things about the base game that just weren't up to par. But the funny thing is with this is it's rated the best way to play as a solo game. 
And that's because as time has gone on, this game has gained a following after the base game and was hit with its lukewarm reviews and lukewarm playthroughs and everything else. Um, I stuck with this thing because I'm a fan of Fallout, the IP, and I was hoping that they would fix this stuff. And so what ended up happening was in 2018, New California landed. And this, as you can mention, as you can see right here, expansion, it brings new quests, companions, vaults, items to follow, letting you venture out into the wasteland as five new characters. And while you're there, you can wander across 12 new map tiles that expand the scenarios found in the original game or head into sunny New California and visit some of the most memorable locations through the Fallout series. So basically the game enlarged in terms of its footprint on the table, in terms of its uniqueness when it was set up and played. You had more quests, more companions, just more of everything. So that just bolstered the experience to a bigger level. And that wasn't necessary and it also bolstered how much you could play solo but it wasn't enough it was good but it wasn't great it was like an expansion that probably leaned more towards helping people that were playing with two to three people uh, two to three individuals around the table and a little bit for the solo players but that is where atomic bonds came in and when atomic bonds came in this was a pack that was specifically looking to push this game to heights that should have been reached when the when the actual base game arrived the first time. Um, and it states right here, the number of scenarios available to you just doubled. So at this point, you have the core game, you have an expansion in New California, then you double that in terms of what you can play. The upgrade pack has everything you need to play every competitive scenario and Fallout and the new California expansion, as I just mentioned, as a cooperative scenario. So now things have really opened up for the solo players. And then rather than struggling against each other, the Atomic Bonds lets you and your friends travel the wasteland, grab better gear, and push your chosen factory to victory together. So now instead of just on your own, pushing, pushing with those silly win conditions from the base game originally, now it's opening the game up to say, here's the deck of cards, the narrative cards. You now get to go through this. And if anybody knows Fallout, the best parts of Fallout is getting through all these quests and checking things out and seeing what's going on and, and the narrative kind of unfolding as you move through the wastelands and stuff like this. That was there in the base game, but it was almost like it was restricted based on its game design. And this Atomic Bonds just knocks the doors off it and allows it. And so you have all this. It says you get extra modifications, mutations, workshop upgrades. Like this literally, and it it's... It sounds like a sales pitch, but I'm I'm telling you right now, like if you played the base game and then you walked away and you said, it's not for me, you need to rethink that. <laughs> you need to rethink. If you have any kind of love for the IP, come back to it and give it another shot with the atomic bonds. I promise you, you will look at this game in a different light. There are still some quirks. There are still some randomness. There's still, you know, enemies that can come out and be pretty disastrous for you and things like that. But the feel, the heart of the game is finally there. I think the most disappointing part for most people is the fact that it took them, you know, two expansion packs to basically get the game to the point of where it should have been from the get-go. And honestly, the Atomic Bonds should have been part of the Fallout core box when it was originally released. That was that would have made a lot more sense and it would have tied up all the loose ends and this would be sitting at an 8.0 easily. My fourth position belongs to Star Wars Outer Rim. This was really special when it did land in 2019 because the last time a Star Wars game had landed that was solo playable was Star Wars Imperial Assault. So it had been some time since Star Wars had been used inside of Fantasy Flight games for a solo game. And so this time around, you're taking yourself out into the Outer Rim, trying to gain fame, and you're running around moving cargo, dealing with, of course, enemies and everything else, and a big race to be the most famous individual in the outer rim so you have all kinds of stuff that you can expect from star wars here now one of the things that drove me a little bit mad was that there were certain decks of cards in the core game and for some strange reason they were super thin still to this day i can't understand it because during playtesting i would have thought that somebody would have might have caught that uh, but there were certain decks that you would rip through at a faster pace. And I always wondered, why didn't they include more cards in that? Well, they eventually fixed that too in an expansion, but similar to kind of follow, but not as bad as follow because 
Star Wars Outer Rim did not need repair band-aids like Fallout did in order to get it kind of on side. Star Wars Outer Rim as a base game stood on its own and was a respectable, solid solo game. So when the expansion came out, it was really bolstering things. And it came out in 2022 and it was called Unfinished Business. And as you can see right here, it packed more of everything in the game. You got character ships, gear, bounties, jobs, encounters, dice, all kinds of extra stuff layering in there. So again, an almost near perfect core game uh, which would have been perfect if it had had enough cards to not feel like you're rifling through the same ones all the time this of course deals with that but it would have been cool if that had already been present in the other one and it would have been maybe more like an 8.0 or something like that but still quite happy with this and that's a crazy high review score for an expansion overall but this thing adding a number of additional things into the fray of course new characters and more cards and more of everything plus some new mechanisms built in as well so uh, this is one, if you are into Star Wars, you have to pick this up if you are a solo player. You have to, have to, have to. If you are not into Star Wars, then of course that is going to be the deciding factor as to whether or not you're okay with trying it out if you're not big into Star Wars because it may not be for you in that case. Um, but this thing is special. And I think Star Wars Imperial Assault and Star Wars Outer Rim, they can easily sit inside the same collection. They have nothing to do with each other. They play completely different and they serve completely different uh, needs and, and wants. I want to say no needs, I guess, in there, <laughs> but wants maybe. Um, either way, I think this one's solid. I really enjoy it and hoping to see maybe even more content come out for it in the future too. Well, my friends, we've reached top three territory and the third position belongs to Marvel Champions, the card game. This is a fantastic implementation of Marvel inside of fantasy flights lcg world and this is going to have you as a hero pitted up against one of the enemies that you're going to take down but while you're trying to just take down that enemy although it sounds pretty straightforward you'll also be dealing with all the schemes that that enemy is throwing out into play which is again just diverting your attention to multiple areas as you try to mitigate multiple things at once which is pretty much every superhero movie ever inside of the marvel universe where they just throw multiple things they have to deal with all the time and pick between them that's a lot of what's going on here. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It is very fun. The deck building is streamlined quick and it does not take a lot of time. Uh, you also have the actual gameplay itself with once, once you get the flow of the game down, you will move through the gameplay quite quickly. You'll only be stopping at moments where you're making crucial decisions that could really impact things. And that does happen quite a bit. It's not like you're going to rip through the game and just hit a crucial decision here and there. Like it's, popping up round by round because things are literally changing the, the the enemy is constantly throwing out threats and and different uh, schemes into the phrase that kind of cause you grief also there's lots of accessories for this so if you're brand new into solo gaming and you're looking for a marvel game and you're looking for something that's a little bit more mature in terms of like how far down the release road it's gone there's a lot out here for this there's lots of expansions there's individual character packs that you can pick up for the heroes most likely the hero you like or heroes you like have decks of cards you can go pick up and then you can play that specific hero which will obviously immerse you in the gameplay experience far beyond just playing generic heroes that you may not care about so there's a lot to love here but once you get down this rabbit hole you could fall down pretty far and there's a lot to collect as well but long story short this one is special it is a great great card game and honestly fantasy flight games does really does some kind of weird magic with card games well, speaking of great card games, this is an amazing one. This is Lord of the Rings, the card game revised core set in the second position on my list. And this is a revised core set of a 2011 originally released Lord of the Rings card game, which you can see right here way back in time. And the current one is much, much better. And that's the best thing about this right now. And one of the major reasons why I want to let you guys know about how awesome this one is, is if you're into Lord of the Rings, this is literally something as a solo player you have to check out. You have to at least try this core set to see whether or not this game is for you. You'll find out in it that there's some heavy deck building going on. So you're going to have a scenario you're going to go up against. You're going to be trying to build a deck in order to try to defeat that particular um, scenario. And you're going to have to spend time in between those scenarios building your deck to kind of tailor it to beat each other's scenario. But it sounds like a lot of work until you start playing it and then you become kind of really connected with the deck in terms of how it works and how it functions. And you can quite easily start determining, well, what things should I move out and move in? What's not helping me? What is helping me? 
and it, and you learn. And, and that's the thing. You start small with a small amount, which is just a core set. And then you start adding in additional content as you go along. So very much like Marvel Champions, where you can kind of just dip your toe into the equation and try it out. Once you get into it, you're going to get into it and you're going to get lost in it. And I got lost. I think I put like 150 plays to 250 plays. Like I had some obscene amount. I put so much time into Lord of the Rings Living Card Game. It actually made sense for me to start a channel, which is one. This is one of the three games that actually got me to just say, you know what? I'm going to teach people how to play games versus uh, just playing them. I want to also show, show others how to play games too and show them how passionate I am about the hobby and stuff like this. And I really equate out of the three games at a Mage Knight, Lord of the Rings, Living Card Game, and Zombicide, the three games that came out in 2011, Lord of the Rings, the card game, was the one game that drove me down the path of solo gaming. So it gets all the credit, and it definitely deserves a second spot on this list. And that, my friends, is going to do it. We made it to the very top of this top 10 solo Fantasy Flight games list. And in the number one position, as you can clearly see, it's Arkham Horror, the card game, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind. This thing, when it landed in 2016, has just been growing. It is more of a beast now than it ever has been. They've been repackaging it. They've been adding more content to it. I mean, the experience here with Arkham Horror is really what they took from Lord of the Rings and learned from it. And then just molded it so perfectly for H.P. Lovecraft. And again, going back to that like gritty, raw feeling that I love from Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, that that is here in Arkham Horror, the card game. They, they found that grittiness, and it's perfect. And they did it by basically saying, well, instead of with Lord of the Rings Living Card Game, where it was like you were... You know, you had three heroes in front of you, you were building a deck, and then you were going to go ahead and make synergies between that to make it all work. This one, you know, they turned around and said, let's make it campaign driven. So there's a narrative across the whole thing. On top of that, let's have, uh, let's go ahead and put strengths and weaknesses into the deck. Make the single deck you're controlling for one character. So you actually have a character that's going through the ringer and his deck is morphing or her deck is morphing, changing over time and is affected by whatever's going on in the campaign. And then on top of it, you have the ability to deck build in between scenarios, but the deck building is a little bit, it's its wide open in terms of options, but it's constrained in terms of how much deck building you can do, which makes the in-between games so much quicker and faster. So you get right back into the fun without a ton of downtime, you know, deck building around things like you would do with Lord of the Rings. So there's just so much stuff they learned and they implemented into this. And the best news about all this stuff, guys, is that as solo players, I mean, we're talking quality stuff from the top of this list. I mean, we have three LCGs at the top of the list and all three of them cater heavily to solo play. I mean, these are these are recommended insanely for solo play. I mean, yes, you have a couple of them where Arkham Horror is, is best at two here, but I mean, in my opinion, I have far, far more fun playing Arkham Horror solo because you get full control over everything. And uh, it's just a fantastic experience. And I can't, I can't wait for them to pump out more content for this thing. It's just the artwork is, is bang on. And again, when I was talking about Arkham Horror 3rd Edition earlier on, a lot of the artwork, again, like came from the card game that already existed and stuff like this. Like they reused a lot of that artwork, but man, this game is so good. Like it's just, it's special. It's very, it's, it's anything and everything you'd ever want it to be if you were an HP Lovecraft fan. Um, and I can't wait to see what else Fantasy Flight Games has up their sleeves in the future. So that's going to do it, guys. That is the entirety of the list. I mean, that was, that was a lot. That was a lot in there. I mean, not only was it 10 or the top 10 solo Fantasy Flight games, but also I got some five honorable mentions buried in there as well. Um, so hopefully between all of that stuff, something in there is of interest to you. If you've never heard of this publisher before, well, you've heard of a whole bunch of games you can play solo now and in a ranked order that I think uh, makes sense for me. I would also love to hear your guys' ranks. Let me know in the comments below, like what do you rank as the top five or top 10 or even top three best fantasy flight games? I would actually love to know that. It's really fun to see other people's lists in the comments. Like I love it when people put that time in to just kind of type that through. It might take you a bit to think about it, but man, is it ever satisfying just to see kind of where other people's heads are at because it's interesting to see how other people put certain games above other ones and their explanations for it. So would love to see that in the comments down below. And also let me know what the next top 10 list should be. 
And of course, it doesn't have to necessarily be top 10. If I only have a top five or top three, I probably wouldn't even bother with a top three. But if I have like only a top five, I'll work with just a top five. But let me know, like, what, what would you like to see? Would you like to see another publisher? What other publisher would you like to see? Uh, would you like to see Awaken Realms next? Maybe they would be a great choice. Or maybe there's somebody else out there that you'd like to see me rank out their games. Let me know. Thank you guys so much for watching. Appreciate it. All the support. And as always, keep on rolling solo.